Well, church, please turn with me in God's Word this morning to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Here we are in a section of Scripture about which much ink has been spilt. Um, it, it is a somewhat difficult passage to interpret, and yet I believe it is very rewarding to the one who would carefully read and look throughout Scripture to understand what God revealed to the prophet Daniel here. As we look at Daniel 9, we're going to look at the last half of the chapter, verses 20 to 27. This is the famous prophecy of the 70 weeks that God revealed to Daniel. And yes, there are many schools of thought and ways of understanding the passage. I hope this morning uh, to give what is a, a pretty simple uh, and straightforward explanation of what is happening here. I want to connect it with other passages throughout Scripture. It's so important that when we examine Scripture, especially a difficult passage, that we look at other places in Scripture that shed light on it and help us to understand it. And my prayer this morning is that this passage will encourage your soul. I've entitled the sermon this morning, The Decreed End of History. Because in it, we are reminded that the future has been decreed by God. That is to say, God has planned the end of history from the beginning of history. God is in control of what happens in time, and this is God's plan for how time will end and how history will reach its final consummation. You will remember that Daniel has been praying on behalf of the people of Israel because of their sin of worshiping pagan gods. They have been placed into exile. The armies of Babylon years before came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and they had been taken off into exile. The prophet Jeremiah said that there would be 70 years of exile for the people of God. And Daniel is here praying about 67 to 68 years into that 70 years. And so he's saying, God, is this exile almost over? Will you please take us back to the land? Lord, will you please restore your people in the city of Jerusalem and even the temple that is there? And in pouring his broken heart out to God... Daniel gets an answer in, not, in chapter 9, verse 20. The Word of God says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. Jerusalem is called the Holy Hill, Mount Zion throughout Scripture. So presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the Holy Hill of my God, for the city of Jerusalem. And while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, this angel who had been introduced to us in chapter 8, the man Gabriel, whom we know is an angel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding at the beginning of your pleas for mercy a word went out and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. We need to understand that this prophecy that is given in the following verses at the end of chapter 9 comes in the context of the prophet of God praying on behalf of the people of God with a broken heart, seeking solace for his soul, asking God, Lord, would you restore? God, I feel hopeless. Would you give me hope? 
Lord, my heart is broken. Would you lift me up? And in pleading and in praying and pouring his heart out to God, the Lord sends the angel Gabriel and God says, I've heard your prayer. And I'm going to give you an answer. And then I love the reason in verse 23. Look at, look at verse 23. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. So as Daniel began to pray in chapter 9, verse 3, as he began to pour out his heart, God heard and He sent a word that Gabriel was to go down and to speak to Daniel. At the beginning of your prayer, a word went out. Do you know that God hears you when you pour your heart out to Him in prayer? And that God at times commands His angels to do His bidding. In this case, to, to bring a word of comfort and of knowledge and of understanding of the future to the prophet Daniel. Gabriel says, I have come to tell it to you. And then here's why. For you are greatly loved. What, what more encouraging words could there be in Scripture that the God of heaven and earth, the King of the universe, loves you. He loves me. He reveals these truths to us because He, he cares about us. When our hearts are broken, He is there to bind us up and to pick us up and to carry us through he says, Daniel, I'm going to reveal these truths to you because I love you. Notice, this passage of prophecy about the, the, the future and what's going to happen until the end of history is not some cold academic examination. But it is in response to the heartfelt plea of Daniel and it is God's merciful and gracious answer to Daniel's prayer whereby God intends to comfort Daniel's broken heart. Sometimes we get so caught up in biblical prophecy and wanting to know about the future that we, we miss the reason why God tells us things about what will happen in the future in the Bible. It's not there so we can impress our friends with how much we know about Bible prophecy. It's there to give us hope. It's there to comfort our hearts. It's there to strengthen our faith and give us certainty and assurance that the end of history has been decreed by God and in the end, Jesus wins. And His people will rule and reign with Him forever. So however we understand the, the verses that follow, don't miss the major point here. There is hope. There is a home for God's children this life is not all that you have. Eternity lies ahead. And the end of history was decreed before the beginning. Now let's look at the prophecy. Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27. What may be the most debated passage in the entire Bible, I would dare to say. Daniel 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression and to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place." Now, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to get so bogged down in what follows that your eyes glaze over and you give up and say, I can't understand what's being said. I think one of the reasons why we miss what the Bible is saying is because we are not familiar enough with the Bible itself. Daniel's 70 weeks here that, that God is revealing to Daniel through the angel Gabriel... The 70 weeks that Daniel writes about here are not meant to mystify or confuse us. We're supposed to be able to understand what the Bible is saying here. 
These are not cryptic words. It is possible to understand what's being said. God is not a God of confusion. So as we look at it, we need to look throughout Scripture for the answers about what's being said here. There are 70 weeks, we are told in verse 24, that are decreed. Now the decree of God is referring throughout Scripture to God's proclamation of the end of history from creation. For instance, Isaiah 46.10, that God is the one who has decreed the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet come to pass, saying, my counsel will stand, and I will accomplish all of my purpose. So God says from creation, when He said, let there be light, when He created the heavens and the earth, He had already decreed the end of history before He started it at creation. That's what this word decree means throughout Scripture. God's plan for history and time, which He declared before He created the heavens and the earth. So 70 weeks are decreed, which means that in God's purpose and plan for the rest of history, it will take place in the framework of 70 weeks. And you think, now wait a minute, Daniel lived, you were telling us, 500 and something B.C., 70 weeks passed a long time ago. That's, that's less than two years, right? Well, it may seem that way. But once again, if you're familiar with Scripture, you would know that, that weeks has been used differently throughout the Bible. Just in the book of Daniel, in chapter 4, we are told that Nebuchadnezzar would be made dumb to eat grass like an ox for a week. And then for seven years, Daniel uh, tells us that Nebuchadnezzar lost his senses and he got on, down on all fours and he ate grass for a week which is seven years. But that's not the first time that appears in the Bible where this, this week of years represents seven years. It first happens in Leviticus chapter 25. Now I know that for most of you here, Leviticus is your favorite book in the Bible, right? You read it every night before you go to bed. In all seriousness, this is why we don't understand so much of the Bible because we ignore so much of the Bible. We, we fail to, to read it and to study it. And I'll just confess here, I had not made the connection between Leviticus 25 and Daniel 9 until I was preparing this sermon. I am guilty of ignoring the book of Leviticus. I've read it many times, but I didn't make this connection. But Gabriel, who gave the vision, and Daniel, who wrote it down, expected us to understand that the 70 weeks is a reference to weeks of years spoken of previously in Scripture in Leviticus 25. Verse 8. God said to the prophet Moses this instruction for ancient Israel. You shall count seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. Years. Okay, so seven weeks of years is seven times seven, 49, for those of you who aren't good at math. Okay, so seven weeks of years is, a week is seven years, times seven is 49 years. So a week means seven years. So you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years you shall give 49 years. The, the Bible is so gracious in helping us with our math. It says, listen, if you don't know what 7 times 7 is, I'll just tell you it's 49. Okay? And then what comes after 49? Well, he's going to tell you in case you, you don't know. Verse 9, Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout the land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year. So 49 years... And then the 50th year is a special year. On the 50th year, you will blow the trumpet and you will proclaim liberty throughout the land 
to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. So the year of jubilee would come every 50 years. Debts would be canceled. Slaves would be freed. Homes that were under mortgage would be returned to the family and the, the, the debt wiped away. It was a year of jubilee, a, a year of freedom from slavery and, and, and debts and, 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 and all the things that had happened in the previous 49 years. So the, the seven sevens, the 49 years, followed by the year of Jubilee, the 50th year, shows a period of time in, in which there is some amount of suffering and sorrow and debt and slavery and after that, God proclaims a year of freedom, a year of jubilee, in which all the debts are canceled and all the slaves are set free. You shall consecrate the 50th year and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return his property and each of you return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. So moving back to Daniel 9 when we read that 70 weeks or 70 sevens are decreed, you should recognize now, I know that Jubilee comes after seven sevens, 49 years. So if there's 70 sevens, 70 times seven, which once again, those for you who are not math scholars, 490 years, that after this period of 70 sevens, a tenfold jubilee that there would be freedom proclaimed. Tenfold of the jubilee years would, ten being a number of fullness and completion and ultimacy in the Bible, a, a tenfold, 490, tenfold jubilee would, would just signify complete and total freedom. Forgiveness, canceling of debt. And so we are told that there will be 70 sevens, a tenfold jubilee that is decreed about your people and your city to finish the transgression. Notice at the end of this tenfold jubilee, God is going to finish transgression. He's going to wipe away sin. He is going to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity. So the first three things that God is going to do all really say the same thing. Finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity. God's going to make sure that your sin is wiped away. We are also told that He is going to bring in an everlasting righteousness. Not just a right standing before God because you have come and brought your animal sacrifice. Animals cannot make you right before God. The book of Hebrews chapter 9 says the blood of bulls and goats never takes away sins. And that merely looked forward to the cross of Christ and what Jesus did at Calvary. But now there is going to be an everlasting righteousness. That is, there's no need to continually sacrifice animals in the temple, but God is going to bring in a permanent state of righteousness when He puts a final end to sin at the end of this tenfold jubilee. Ultimate freedom from sin and its curse. After this time, we are told that God is going to seal both vision and and profit. Seal both vision and profit. Well, what does that mean? Well, throughout Scripture, sealing of vision and prophecy, such as at the end of the book of Revelation, when the, when the book is closed up and sealed, it means that nothing is to be added to it. That, 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 that at the end of this time, prophecy and, and, and visions will cease because God's full revelation has been given. A similar uh, phrase occurs in the book of Zechariah, chapter 13. Beginning in Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10, the prophet Zechariah prophesied that a Messiah would come who would be pierced 
and God's people would grieve and mourn for him. Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly as one weeps over a firstborn. It's interesting in Zechariah 12.10 that God says they're going to mourn for this man who will be pierced because of course they pierced his hands and feet with the nails when they nailed him to that cross. And God says, and in doing so they will mourn for him. So somehow the one who will be pierced will be God himself. Jesus, of course, is the God-man, God in human flesh, who was nailed to that cross to pay for our sins. Then following that, chapter 13, verse 1 of Zechariah, we are told on that day, on the day when the Messiah will be pierced, when He will be crucified, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David. Do you know that beautiful hymn? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Where does that hymn come from? From Zechariah 13, verse 1. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Now listen what will happen after the crucifixion of the Messiah. And on that day, the day of the Messiah declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and his mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. Now according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, the reason you would kill someone who had prophesied is if he uttered a false prophecy. And so we are being told here that there will come a time when every so-called prophet by definition will be a false prophet because God is going to cease giving visions and prophecy after the time of the Messiah. Once again, it says, if anyone again prophesies after this day of the Messiah, after that time, if anyone again prophesies, his father and his mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. You claim to hear from God, but you're not hearing from God. You're making this up. You're lying. And his father and his mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. And on that day, after the day of the Messiah, when he comes, on that day, every so-called prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will no longer put on a hairy cloak to deceive. But he will say, I am no prophet. Going back to Daniel 9... We are told that after this 70 weeks and when, when the Messiah comes, not only will sin be wiped out and atoned for, but God is going to seal both vision and prophet. And I believe that that sealing of prophecy and vision came in Revelation chapter 22, Verses 18 and 19, which is at the very end of your Bible, where the prophet John writes, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Which is to say, this book, the Bible, is complete. Those are the last words of Scripture ever given. And when God, through the prophet John, completed the final book, the book of Revelation, prophecy and vision were sealed until the time when the Messiah would return. This is why it's so dangerous for people to say, well, God told me so and so. Or to claim a gift of prophecy. I want to caution you, brothers and sisters. 
The end of Revelation says, If anyone would claim to prophesy and add to the word of God, saying that he has heard from the Lord, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone would try to take away from what's in this book, that God will take away his share in the tree of life. I believe that after the time of the Messiah and his apostles, when the last apostle John died, writing the book of Revelation, that vision and prophecy were healed. Zechariah 13 says so, Daniel 9 says so, and Revelation 22 says so. I could point you to other passages, but for the sake of time, I think it is clear that there will not be a 67th book of the Bible written. It is sealed. It is complete. God will seal both vision and prophet. And then lastly, through the coming of this Messiah, He will anoint a most holy place. In 1 John chapter 2, we are told that we have been anointed by God's Holy Spirit as believers in Christ. When it says here that God will anoint a most holy place, yes, the temple would be rebuilt some years after Daniel gave this prophecy. In the year 515 B.C., the temple would be rebuilt and completed. That's about 23 years after Daniel gave this prophecy. So, yes, the temple in Jerusalem would be rebuilt. But we are told at the end of this coming of the Messiah which is much later than the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem under Ezra and Nehemiah, we are told that much later in history, when the Messiah comes, God will anoint a most holy place. I think we see this fulfilled in the New Testament where we are told in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, that the church, the body of Christ, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Or in 1 Corinthians 6, We are told that your own body as a believer in Christ is a temple of the Holy Spirit because God's Spirit resides in you if you are a child of God. When it says here that God will anoint a most holy place, He is talking about the Spirit of God taking up residence within every blood-bought, born-again believer in Christ and also within the corporate body of the local church. To say that He will anoint a most holy place means He will establish His church that after this Messiah comes, He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, verse 25. When will the Messiah come? Daniel is going to tell us. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the Word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks Then for 62 weeks it shall be rebuilt again with squares and emotes, but in a moat, but in a troubled time. Now, the translation of verse 25 is going to vary between your translations. I disagree somewhat with the ESV's translation here. I would prefer the translation of uh, the King James, New King James, NIV, NASB, if you have any of those Bibles, NET, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, I would go with their translation of these verses. Uh, It could be translated either way separating the 62 weeks and the 7 weeks or putting them together. The Hebrew could be translated either way. So we got to look at the context to try to figure out the right way to translate this and understand what's being said. He says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the Word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah. Literally, the Hebrew says, to the coming of Mashiach, Messiah. There will be... Seven weeks and 62 weeks, literally is what the Hebrew says. From the going out of the Word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah, a ruler, a prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, Messiah, of course, is Jesus. He is the promised Messiah, the promised King, the promised ruler. And we are told that He will come seven weeks and 62 weeks of years after the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. What is the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? Well, you can read about it in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 and following, where King Artaxerxes in the year 483 B.C. proclaimed that the people could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem and the city. 
So they go back under Nehemiah and they rebuild the walls and then they rebuild the city. I think why it's divided into seven weeks, 49 years, and 62 weeks, the remainder of the 483 years, I think the reason why it's divided is because for the first seven weeks, Jerusalem is being rebuilt. Now they rebuilt the wall in just over 50 days, we read in the book of Nehemiah. But nonetheless, when they went back, they had to rebuild the whole cities. The whole city of Jerusalem, notice, it will be built again with squares and a moat. It's going to be built well and, and, and to spec, so to say. And that would encompass the seven weeks of years, 49 years. So, so for a generation, for, for about half a century, they were rebuilding Jerusalem, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., so once Jerusalem is rebuilt, there will be another 62 years before the Messiah comes. So from the going out of the Word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 483 B.C., there will be seven, years of re- seven weeks of years of rebuilding Jerusalem, and then after it's rebuilt, there will be an additional 62 weeks of years before the Messiah comes. And once again, there's a lot of math here, so let me just break it down for you. 69 weeks of years, uh, being 483 years, if you subtract that uh, from 458, the year when King Artaxerxes and Ezra 711 uh, proclaimed that they could go back and rebuild the city, takes you to about the year 25 AD, which is about the beginning of Jesus' ministry when John the Baptist in the New Testament says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, God reveals here to the prophet Daniel the very year in which the Messiah would come and be revealed to the world by John the Baptist. He would have a ministry of about three years and then he would be crucified. And Daniel here tells us down to the year when this will all happen. about the year 25 A.D. when Jesus came and then would a few years later be crucified. Now what's going to happen after the Messiah comes? Verse 26, And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, once again, Messiah, Jesus, shall be cut off and shall have nothing, meaning he will be killed. He will be crucified. So after he comes... He will be killed. And the people of the prince who is to come, who shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, we are told here about a new ruler, a new prince. And this prince who's identified in the second half of verse 26 is not called Messiah. He is a prince, a human ruler, the people of the prince who is to come, who shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. He is going to attack Jerusalem and attack the sanctuary. And I believe the sanctuary is not just talking about the destruction of the temple, which would happen again in the year AD 70, but ultimately he is going to attack God's own people himself. We saw that in Daniel chapter 9, where the little horn who came out of the fourth kingdom attacked God's people and made war against them. And so we are told here that this prince who is to come, the one introduced in Daniel 7, the little horn of the fourth kingdom, the figure that we call the Antichrist of the very end of history, he will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And it shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war, desolations are decreed. I hate to tell you, but things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. For those who have an eschatology, a view of the end times, where things are going to get better, I simply do not know how they reconcile passages like Daniel 9, verse 26. Because we are told as history goes on, there will be war and more war and desolations have been decreed by God from the foundation of the earth. I simply cannot accept what is a post-millennial eschatology which believes that things are going to get better before Jesus comes back. I think the Bible consistently throughout tells us that things are going to get worse 
and worse. And at the very end, before Jesus comes, this figure, this real person will show up whom the Bible calls the Antichrist or or, or the prince who will destroy Jerusalem and, and make war on God's people. That there is going to be absolute devastation. Look at verse 27. And he, this prince, this Antichrist, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come the one who makes desolate. The Antichrist will show up and he will cause absolute calamity and desolations through war on the earth. He will do this until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Until Jesus comes back and kills the Antichrist personally. As 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Jesus will come and at His return He will kill this man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, with the breath of His mouth. He will blow on Him and the Antichrist will fall over dead. Now, your head may be spinning and I just want to say to you as I draw to a close this morning, if you have questions, come back tonight at 6 o'clock when we meet for our evening worship and you can ask all the questions you have. I do want to, before we close, read Jesus' interpretation of these prophecies in Matthew 24, verse 15. Because Jesus explains to us what Daniel is talking about here with this coming ruler who's going to make war on God's people and then God Himself is going to come back and kill this, this man. Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel... That is in the verse we just read, Daniel 9, 27. When you see this figure, the abomination of desolation, who is spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Carefully read what your Bible says here, Jesus says. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You need to run, he says in verse 22, uh, verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and will never be. After this Antichrist figure appears, there's going to be a period that Jesus calls the Great Tribulation. Jesus says, If those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, because of God's people, those days will be cut short. And then at the end of that time, we are told, Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this intense period of war and suffering and attack upon Believers in Christ, at the end of this great tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the heavens, and then will appear in the heavens the sign of the Son of Man, and the Son of Man will come upon the clouds of heaven in power and great glory, and He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather His elect from the four winds. At the end of this period of intense suffering, Jesus is coming back, and He's going to get His bride together, and He is going to conquer this Antichrist figure, and He is going to usher in glory. Now, I know there's a lot of details there, and maybe you didn't follow them all, but Daniel is basically telling us, and God is encouraging Daniel, and by extension us here today, that at the end of history, Jesus is coming back to make all things new. So you need not be afraid. I know your heart is troubled now. I know you're brokenhearted now. I know things are hard now. But Jesus is coming back, and eternity is ahead for those who trust in Him. That's the message of the 70 weeks. Yes, there there is some incredible specificity uh, predicting the very year in which the Messiah would be revealed by John the Baptist and and this coming end times figure, Antichrist. There, There is incredible specificity in the prophecies, but the big picture is Jesus wins and those who trust in Him will live with Him forever. And that's the meaning of the passage. Let's give thanks and pray to our God.